Well, thanks for coming. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And I've been involved with, with CSUN for many years, um, actually since its predecessor, the International um, uh, Sustainability Indicator Network, had its conference in, in Toronto back in 2002, I think it was. So it's great to see it come back and, and to be part of this again. Uh, and I, I'm also glad to be able to um, open up the discussion of, uh, of the role of culture in sustainability. And um, just a, a bit about me, I've spent most of my career working in museums over 25 years at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And uh, they're doing a lot of research on how people interacted with cultural material, mostly artworks, but um, uh, trying to understand the role of creativity for a personal visitor, a, a viewer um, to, the, to the institution. But a, a while ago, I, I had the good fortune of getting involved in a, a sustainability network um, called Leadership for Environment and Development, um, created by the Rockefeller Foundation back in the early 90s. And it opened up my eyes amazingly. I was suddenly th gone from the, the narrow world of art museums to um, engineering and law and medicine and science and environmental issues and economists and suddenly looking at the world very differently. But what always has stayed with me is that I, I believe fundamentally doesn't matter what kind of um, shifts we create in technology or in governance or um, economic structure. If there isn't a shift at the cultural level, how individuals understand and live in their world, there will be no sustainability. And and so one of the interesting things that's happening in, in CSUN is this tension between top-down orientation and bottom-up. And so my questions uh, um, around culture and sustainability really have more to do with, um, or a greater focus anyway, on, on how do you engage the population in thinking about where they are in a sustainable or non-sustainable world, and um, how do you encourage them to open up that dialogue uh, and to think differently um, and to begin to change their lives. At the same time, there's need for systems change that are going, that has to happen throughout all of society. So that's just a little background on how I um, came to be here. There are a few publications for anyone who's interested that I brought along that might be of, of some interest to some of you. I wonder if Lynn can just say something about you. I'm Lynn Tether, and I'm a museologist. But as a museologist, don't think of me as just a person who inhabits four-walled buildings with the museum on the front of it. We're actually engaged in many notions of cultural heritage, community, international development, et cetera. And in my own work, I work between doing history volumes on the history of the uh, early history of the Royal Ontario Museum over to international development work with museums and communities in Africa, in Nigeria in particular, around a site. And recently have a, a foray, uh, making a foray into sustainable tourism and um, cultural heritage notions. So I come at it quite differently um, in a way, but we shall see how this all works out. So it's a great pleasure to be able to support you in this workshop, I hope. so. Um, great to be working together. Yeah. So, and with all of you. So, the next slide. So, just wanted to give you some sense of what we hope to achieve today, and that is that each of you will um, spend some time thinking about the role that culture plays in defining your own life. Secondly, we want to identify ways that our society's unsustainability, and I think um, there's no one in this, in this meeting, this conference, that doesn't um, believe that we are on a completely and utterly unsustainable path. Um, and so to identify ways that our society's unsustainability is rooted in cultural values and behaviors. And thirdly, to identify ways to create and use cultural indicators that can help shift how individuals and societal systems operate. So those are our ambitions. Um, and uh, we're going to get there through lots of conversation. But before we got, uh, go any further, um, we did want to just ask you um, what you came here expecting. Because if we can, we will try and address some of those, those things. Or did I already capture everything? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. And we will absolutely get into that. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the notion of culture shift. I'm on two committees at Simon Fraser University. One is the Committee on Teaching and Learning, Improving the Practice of Teaching and Learning, and the other is the Sustainability uh, Assessment Committee for our campus. And in both different meetings, uh, the, the main buzzword is trying to create a cultural shift. Or, right for different reasons. One, in terms of making teaching more prominent in our institution, and the other, making sustainability more prominent in our institution. But cultural shift is the main term that it will OK. And, and I think it fits well here, because culture is nothing if not constantly changing and, and evolving. And sometimes it's not so easy to think about culture as a constantly changing thing, because we've, we've often um, put it into, into these kind of margin, margins where culture is defined largely by history, ethnocultural pasts, um, or particular kinds of activities. But I think, in fact, if we think about how people live their lives, that's constantly evolving. Um, but in our culture, we have taken culture and kind of packaged it and put it aside as part of the leisure time economy. And, um, and it's got an academic dimension to it and, and uh, et cetera. But absolutely, we, this, that is the point of this, um, look, to look at that shift and how can one facilitate it, help to facilitate it. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I would be curious to know how you measure the sustainability of the culture. Like how do you compare <coughs> cultures and how you know, one's more sustainable than the other? <clears throat> and, um, and so measurement is a, a critical um, piece of this, obviously, and it's why, why we're here. Um, I've been, um, one of the things I, I've done over the last 10 years is to um, work with a group called the Working Group on Museums and Sustainable Communities. And, uh, we worked with the museum community, mostly developing workshops, trying to get a framework in place um, to generate indicators, cultural indicators. And we are going to talk about that. And it's my, my feeling that, um, uh, that you can't come at it with single dimension indicators. You've got, somehow got to find a stratified way, multiple indicators um, looking, looking at cultural dynamics and somehow manage to bring them together. I, I don't know how to do it, but that'll be part of what you'll see um, being brought out today. And we can talk about it. Yeah. I'm curious about uh, how to, to uh, what to do next. So if you measure, you measure because you want to manage. And which kind of interventions do you have in mind to change culture if this is even possible? With my background of sustainable consumption and uh, production in Europe, I think we have a, lot, a huge debate about information changing habits, information changing decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you have this as a balance, you have information, you have prices. And we don't talk about prices, we just talk about information. Mm -hmm. So we have very cheap um, offers for air travel, for, for coming from airlines so you go skiing for one day right. for less than 100 euro and meanwhile we give information about carbon footprint <laughs> and on the one hand we send one signal saying oh that's cheap you can go for a day skiing mm -hmm. by plane on the other hand we give information about carbon footprint well the, there's no question that there's contradictory signals um, from top to bottom in our society on the sustainability front. And yes, we are talking more about it, but are we doing very much about it? And you know, are we making much progress? So it is a big issue. One of, one of my interests is how can you stimulate change within the whole set of cultural organizations that are out there so that they are less bound by this um, tourism-based economy um, uh, people through the door um, activity than, um, than this business of engaging people in, in dialogue and discussion and reflection and about changing actions so that they become more consciously connected to the uh, cultural issues of our day. Um, too often, I think, entertainment is uh, still the, um, 
the, the sort of precinct of, of most um, cultural organizations. So what would you like us to write down precisely on that expectation yeah. list? I would just say that at a, a slightly more abstract level, I'm interested in uh, and hope to learn a bit about how an, a measurement approach can help take an area that has been pigeonholed and expand our understanding of it more okay. broadly. So it might not be, I'm not specifically interested in culture, uh, but I am interested in seeing if there's some generalizations from the overall approach that might apply to other pigeonholed areas. Uh, so how measurement can help lead to change? Um, yeah, a broader understanding of either a sector or uh, any area that relates to sustainability that we'd like to see a shift in. OK. This is the, sort of the process piece. OK, and we'll, hopefully we will, that will come out um, in the process of this as well. So um, there's going to be an introductory exercise, which is um, uh, why you've been given all these letters and things, and all that confusing moving around. We're going to discuss issues about definitions um, uh, r relating to culture and its intersections with sustainability. And um, uh, also, we wanted you to do something quite active in terms of uh, developing uh, uh, some assessment indicators. But this will also include developing some um, cultural um, engagement, public engagement strategies uh, that can, that will fit well with the some of the indicators that you're you're thinking of developing. So Lynn is going to take over for a bit. Right. This is our first exercise, and um, as you will appreciate, we're ambitious and said a lot to do in this hour and a half that we have. But hour. What, oh gosh. <laughs> Um, and I'm kind of policing the time, so forgive me if I interrupt Doug. He's a dear friend. He won't <laughs> mind. Um, and you may mind, but that's fine. I just want you to, um, as an icebreaker in a way, spend a couple of minutes and write down two short descriptors, um, one to three words that would provide a sense of what we've said here is how your culture is expressed in your life. Yeah, so each individually come up and put one. You, you have to choose which of the one that you wrote um, that you want. To, to put up there. Okay, we need just one. Well, one that, page. that's fine. Yeah? That's fine. Okay, so here we have, well, interestingly, we have two family. Um, and uh, we have someone who's identified their cultural issue or driver as worldview. Would you just like to explain that for a second? Sure. Uh, basically, I was just making the link between um, uh, my cultural background and the way I see the world. So that's why I just put down worldview. Uh, I was a professor for 40 years, so my life was wrapped around scholarship. But I think that scholarship should be uh, engaged um, in political action. And the two things together say who I am. Uh, one of the things I like about the culture that I live in is it allows me to um, continue the rel relentless pursuit of different perspectives, which uh, I really enjoy. Um, I just wrote fast paced because we live in a very fast paced um, environment. You know, we're always undergoing a gazillion things at once. I guess that perfectly describes me as well. So, yeah, fast paced. Very good. Um, we have also someone who has identified themselves as Canadian. I am Canadian. I was born, raised Canadian. Uh, it's the culture to which I uh, identify myself. And that was my understanding of, uh, of the descriptor that we were looking for. So I am Canadian. At the same time, we have someone else saying they are Métis and bracket multicultural. Want to just expand on that a bit? Well, it's basically uh, about being Canadian, I guess. It's, uh, uh, my worldview is to, uh, to uh, 
I consider myself Métis because I, I recognize all my ancestry, and uh, which includes native French, Irish, uh, so, uh, and it's a, uh, I guess it's being a um, worldview, having a worldview uh, maybe with a different pair of eyes. All right, we have someone who's written healthy sport food. Yeah, I mean, um, health is a, is a big value of my life, and um, uh, as such, some of the choices are just no-brainer, like uh, when we talk about um, you know, clean, uh, clean air, clean water, clean nature, um, or healthy food. It's, uh, sometimes I'm just wondering why even we have a debate on that. It's a no-brainer. Uh, mentally and physically, people should be healthy, and that should be a, a value, and that's sort of my life. Um, the next exercise we'll do is just think for a moment about whether there are commonalities or differences here. It's a, it's a great title as well. Thank you. Uh, Canadian, but recognizing cultural. Yeah. Okay. Do you want? Um, no. Okay. So, so almost bracketing this. Mm -hmm. Forgive me if I edit here. <laughs> I can't help myself. Yes, sir. I just find it difficult to know how, how any of these could not be about identity. Like mine was car free, for example. And why I put that is I grew up in Calgary and I didn't have a car and it felt very odd being in Calgary without a car, which is such a car city. But when I moved to Vancouver, where it was more acceptable, and I started finding that the most important thing of my identity was that act of transport, and other people were, I'd meet would be, oh, oh, you bike too, or you bike, or you walk, or whatever. And that was a part of my, what I found was my identity. It was a subculture within, you know, Canadian identity or whatever else, right? But so I would see it being the one that said green, or that said that family was important, all of those, aren't those a part of your identity? So you're making a really important point that we don't um, take culture, small c, or in quotation marks, and hive it off. They're all related. As a person who drives a car quite often, because I'm a country girl, um, did you see the exhibit at the Museum of Vancouver on cycling? Wonderful exhibit this past summer. Yeah. It uh, was progressive and wonderful, and that's Vancouver. So, okay. Um, so, so what do we do with that question about identity? Well, I think this gentleman's making a really important point that all of this fits in. So you want this over here? They're all identity related. So I would see something like family characterize and fall under that um, descriptor. So that your environment shapes, or your environment in somewhat defined, shapes your culture, and your environment shapes your personality, and so it's it's inter. I mean, it's a it's kind of a closed loop system. So you can create your your environment by creating a family, but the family also helps to create you. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and of course your family shapes your personality, and so your environment shapes your, you know. Your personality, but and then your cult, the culture in which you're embedded also shapes your personality, and so on. But it's a fairly significant point because I wouldn't tend to think that way. I would think in terms of culture generating the environment, and thus we're two sides of a coin. Yes. Um, I, in, in comment to that, and what I think you're you're kind of alluding to, and what I think is important, particularly when we're talking about things like sustainability, is. What you're trying to do is categorize things here and put them in silos. And we know for a fact, we live, we f breathe, we feel, we understand intuitively that culture is a very complex thing and, and you can't put it in a silo. There are many, many different aspects, many, many different levels and we live this and we accept it and, and we just automatically take it virtually for granted because this is the way it is. And we need to so get away from trying to categorize and silo things in sustainability, and we certainly don't want to do it with something like culture, because then you start to say, well, you know, I think this is the most important part of culture. Well, that is to you, but, you know, to you, something else is more important, and so on. It's, it gets back to the other things 
uh, some of what was talked about this morning about uh, place-based uh, and the importance of place-based uh, perspectives and, and initiatives. And that's where things were, where the rubber hits the road sort of thing. That's where things happen. So things happen with you and emanate outwards, so bottom up. But you're also a part of the top. Wherever you are, comes down too. And make no mistake, whatever you do in your, your work life, you bring your, your personal life to it and vice versa. Uh, perhaps not to the same degree. You can leave certain aspects at work. But um, basically, you're all of you in everything that you do. So does everybody agree I should stop categorizing? In fact, <laughs> we just explode this again anyway after I categorize. So you've yeah. jumped ahead. So that's wonderful. Our point um, wasn't to define no. culture in this way. But it's we're, just to start playing with it. But the, there's a part of us that are museum people. So we start putting labels <laughs> on. We start putting you in little divisions. And that's, that's the problem. So what we're going to do now is move along to the content-based portion. And um, OK, Doug, that's you. OK, we did have a question here. Um, and it's the, the question of the day in some ways. Um, how do we take these notions of culture and cultural identity and link them to sustainability? Um, and you could argue that, that green might be aligned in some way with sustainability. And one would hope that family um, can be aligned, but maybe within parameters. And um, having multiple perspectives in a globalized world, how can you not? Um, isn't that a prerequisite for for sustainability. So there's a, a ton of ways in which I think we could look at even this small sampling of um, descriptors and try and map them a little bit onto this question of sustainability. Um, OK. So what we were going to do now is to move into the, the second um, real phase of, of today's uh, event, look at culture and its intersections with sustainability. We're going to start with. Um, a definition of, of culture that I found useful in my work. Because uh, in museums, you often get these definitions of culture that um, get trotted out. It's all about ethnic um, uh, heritage and, and objects and song and dance, and etc. But this one came from Edgar Sheen, a basic pattern of assumptions invented, discovered, or developed by a given group as it learns to cope with its problems of external adaptation and internal integration. So basically, as the world is changing, culture needs to be that organic mechanism that, that um, is, is hopefully aligned with those changes. And it allows for transformation. Um, and it, it's not just a matter of adaptation, but he, Sheen suggests it's also a matter of internal integration. So that's a piece about consciousness. Not only do you have to adapt as a culture to a changing environment, but you have to internalize and integrate those changes. Um, these definitions um, will be on a handout, so you don't necessarily have to scribble them down. Um, I wanted to, to give you another one. This is a definition that I cooked up because I needed one, and I hadn't encountered Sheen's yet. Um, and all of the ways in which a people relate to those aspects of life which, A, they can know and control, as well as those that they can't fully know or control, but to which they must have a conscious relationship. And if you think about culture traditionally, it's been very closely aligned with spirituality, whether it's religion or, or something. But it's been um, human. It is really focused on the human ability to relate to those things that they can know and control, absolutely, food, dance, et cetera, et cetera. And some of that is just a social. Um, uh, reality that's created within, within human um, communities. But there's also this business of relating to things that they can't know and control. And that's where religion and ritual, in fact, it's a huge part of what has historically been the heart of culture. And in some ways, uh, culture as we think of it now has, has had a lot of that removed. Um, it's now seen as a discipline-based um, kind of thing in, in many instances, or else it's a, a, a temporal thing, just looking at the past. Where have you come from? So these are just a couple of considerations as we move forward. Um, I like to use this image, culture is standing on the shoulders of ancestors, because it acknowledges that, that you are 
an individual who has a lot of capacity, but you didn't get there on your own. Some of us like to think that we created ourselves, um, but we actually arrived here because there was a whole cultural continuum of which we are a part, and we have inherited a certain um, uh, set of realities, and we will pass them, pass re realities along. I think it's where, in some way, respects the Aboriginal notion of seventh generation planning. Um, the, the idea that if you're going to plan for, for something, you have to think, can I imagine looking at my descendants seven generations out and say, I made the best, best decision in your interests? I mean, we, do, we tend to think in quarterly terms um, in our society. So standing on the shoulders of ancestors, just another image I wanted you to, to, to have in mind. And culture, um, and I think we've, we've seen it in many instances around um, the, these descriptors, is about relationships. And um, I think most of us, if we think about um, culture, we, we often start with ourselves uh, in some way. And when we're born, there is nothing else. You, you, be, you come into a world and, and, uh, and you interact with family. And um, there is an environment as well. But along the way, you, you grow and develop and start interacting with community, however that's defined, however family is defined. Society becomes a, a next frame of reference. Um, global humanity becomes a, another one. Throughout all of this, the environment is, permeates everything. You are um, part of that natural environment that you're engaged with. And then beyond that is the unknown. And um, that is the kind of spiritual dimension. So it's not just the temp like the present. Um, it's more complex than that. It has a past, it has a present, and it has a future. And if you look at the dynamics, it is the movement of consciousness and activity and behavior through all of these different relationship frames. Um, and there are pressures that come from outside. Um, they exert pressure on the collective, on the systems that, that society creates. It also creates huge pressures on individuals and smaller groups. Um, and it is all the complexity that we've alluded to um, up to now. And, uh, and so again, I, I tend to think of, of culture in that relationship term and a, as a dynamic that is always, um, always with us. So that a collective, you come from a particular past, and um, there was a reference to Métis. So that's a different past than what I might have experienced where my ancestors uh, came from, from England. Um, so that's different. So we all end up in a, and in a pluralist society where everybody seems to have different pasts. It becomes a very difficult thing to understand, well, what is it that we are collectively connected to in terms of the temporal past? Um, it's because it's different. And so is the trajectory of, of what you're passing on, it's not a straight line, right? Suddenly, pluralism becomes a defining quality of what our culture is. And a big question is, what is the culture of pluralism? How does it interact with all of those other things, including the unknown? And I would say that in some ways, pluralist, urban, um, uh, urbanized uh, societies have become governed by principles of civil society. And for the most part, civil society doesn't focus out here. It's very pragmatic. It deals with housing, employment, um, transportation, da -da 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 -da. and these are the concrete things that can be managed. Um, but I think culture takes us to a whole other level out here, and it is one of the uh, sort of lost dimensions in some way of, of our cultural reality today. But I do think that this is where having museums, the, this is a potential, certainly not the, the case now, but museums and cultural organizations have the potential to play facilitating roles in this. Um, and the movement of uh, energy um, at the individual level, at the community level, but identifying how this dynamic is working and working with it. And so perhaps it, they shouldn't be fueled by things like, we'll have an exhibit of the treasures of Tutankhamun or the Catherine the Great, um, which to me be, only becomes more and more absurd as I, I think about it. Sustainability and unsustainability is a, a cultural matter. And it's rooted in 
our values and in our behaviors, our attitudes, our priorities, and our systems. Going back to the systems. And this is the traditional sustainability model. Everybody, everybody knows it. Um, but I, I tend to think of it um, a little differently. And I, I think that really all of this sits on the foundation of culture. It's not a fourth leg. It's not a, a fourth dimension. It is the foundation, from my perspective, of our relationship with the environment, with the economy, and with ourselves. Um, and if we begin to think about that, and then what are the, the elements of culture, we wonder, well, how would you define this thing called culture down here? And these are maybe some attributes that, that I think are important. The capacity for reflection um, at individual and collective levels. How much do we really reflect on the issues that are important? Um, how much do we, do we think when we buy a product um, whose life has been involved in this product um, on the other side of the planet um, for it to, to make its way to me. Um, participation and engagement. This is the whole question, really, of, of um, um, having community where, where participation is a part of the cultural dynamic. And, uh, and it raises the, the issue of democracy and do we have a form of democracy that really fosters that, or does representative democracy not do it um, in some ways? It's not an adequate um, uh, political framework. Relatedness and connection to others. Do we feel that sense of connection? And living in the city, it's getting harder and harder to feel connection to the natural world, um, even though we live in it in all kinds of ways. We, we become um, separated from it, too. An awareness of history, and um, history in some ways is seen as a as a leisure time um, thing to do. Oh, I go to a history exhibit or something, and isn't that fascinating? And uh, there's a trip to the distillery, and which is is a, an interesting thing for me. There are my ancestors who built that distillery, the Goodman Wirtz Distillery, um, but not everybody is thinking about the past as they uh, and as a way to learn from it. Creativity. It's amazing how many people are afraid of their own creativity. Part of that, I think, is because institutions have said, these are the people who are creative. Now we have to go in and appreciate their creativity. And uh, I think that those institutions have, have actually become barriers to fostering creativity at the individual level. Conscious systems of knowledge, including values. That's a whole other thing. Values are, are not nearly as simple as they, uh, as they appear to be. Very slippery critters. Um, connection to the symbolic and the spiritual. That's really the unknown thing. Connection to what cannot be controlled. Responsible action, to me, is an attribute of a culture. This is a culture that's integrating with sustainability. Capacity to embrace change. And in that context, when I look at cultural, the cultural sector, and they go measuring what um, are the measures of their success, it's almost invariably a number. It's attendance at this, or, or the revenue that's come from that, or the number of objects that have been accessioned, or, mm -hmm. Yes. So what it I'm is. getting at is we're defining it here. It could change if it gets changed. It could. I think that, that will change how we measure it. Absolutely. And, and we're nowhere near measuring um, with this list here. Um, that's for sure. But we are trying to define it. And you're right. It is in this, in this moment. Because 200 years ago, it would have been different. And 100 years from now, it presumably will be different. Um, probably, how many people are familiar with Buzz Holling's work on adaptive renewal? OK, um, biologist, um, very briefly, what he described uh, was um, life cycles in ecosystems. And what he saw after um, exploring these for, for decades is that um, uh, systems go through predictable life cycles. And, and here, there's a, a cycle in which um, 
there are a number of resources that are available and they opportunistically come together and they start to, they self-organize essentially and they become um, a system, a simple system. And as it, as it evolves, it becomes more complex and it, it uh, is inclined to try and preserve itself. But at a certain point, invariably, these things become um, uh, increasingly complex and often the, the forces from outside the system will um, try and break them down and there will be a, a moment at which a transformation takes place and the, the capital that was, was assembled here and developed here will be at least partially released um, through this phase in ready for re getting ready for reorganization. Now this can be a, um, um, a, a kind of a slow uh, process of adaptation or it can be collapse. And so just to give you an example, an ecosystem um, here is a very complex set of systems. So there are many different systems operating um, inside this puddle. Now this puddle may have only um, been there and will only be there for a few hours, but it will have a rich life set of cycles going on and then it will dry up. Um, but there's lots of big systems within which this is embedded. And at a certain point though, um, where these shocks come in and collapse takes place, you can have things like a fire that just wipes out the entire forest. So at one level, you've got systems that don't destroy the whole structure, but they're small and they're all connected right up to the level of the big one, collapse. And so um, adaptive renewal is one of these notions that is increasingly being um, applied to culture. How does it affect? the development and change of culture. And sometimes, I think in culture, we are really focused on trying to preserve what was. Uh -huh. I'll just b briefly mention, because we, this, is, this is part of Buzz Holling's um, model, which is really referenced a lot in any systems thinking um, kind of framework. And uh, this notion of, of um, uh, systems embedded one in another and that they are connected is uh, a, critical, a critical notion. And, um, and so uh, they're connected in, in interesting ways, and we, we won't get into that um, now. But sustainability um, is the capacity to create, test, and maintain adaptive capability. So that, that's an interesting process-based um, definition, uh, you know, one of the hundreds we've heard about, right, <laughs> of uh, sustainability. Part of the problem, development is a process of creating, testing, and maintaining opportunity. Yeah. Okay, but if we're going to not do the exercise, then I'll just quickly say that adaptation is something that you'll recognize in your own life um, through um, these kinds of things. So you may have gone through a breakup or a divorce. Anyway, it's interesting that when you, you get together with someone and there is something kind of magical, full of potential, um, and, and huge amounts of energy are expended and, and it grows into something and then at a, a certain point it becomes a constraining. It can become a constraining phenomenon in your life and you try and figure out how, the, how to survive this and ultimately you find yourself facing choices about adapting or changing in some way or else you have to abandon and that's the release, the collapse. Some people are able to go through those adaptations and other ones are not and um, and so changes in a career. I did that after 25 years in a, in the, in a museum. Um, big crisis to, to actually pull myself out of that. Moving from the city to the country, or from the country, it's, yeah, right. The, at the collective level, these developments of new technologies some, you know, propel us into new possibilities. And, and then we find the constraints. So what once was energy provided by wood is a constraint that um, is replaced by coal, which becomes constrained um, again by pollution issues. We find oil, and that now has become a critical um, constraining thing, leads to transformation. And so you can see monocultures to pluralism, urbanization. And at the institutional level, it's really the ability of an institution to go back to its first principles and not to say, this is what we do. Yeah, yeah, I thought that's what we do. So that's what we're going to do. It's to say, hmm, what's changed? These are our first principles, but do, does our organization have the capacity to adapt here and to change and to become something um, new that's relevant in the here and now? 
and they can be either maladaptive or, or adaptive. Okay, so now we are into um, this notion of feedback loops and, and um, examples where in order for us to, um, um, to walk that incredible line of sustainability, we have to know um, something about where we are. We need feedback. And so we, we rely on statisticians to give us some idea of this kind of stuff, that human population for thousands of years is almost flat, and then all of a sudden, um, through the, the miracle of um, a compound, or um, what's it called, um, exponential change, exponential growth, this is what happens. And it took all of human history to 1800 for there to be one billion people, only 130 to get to two, and look at what's happened, and now it's only you know, 12 years to get um, from the uh, fifth billion to the sixth billion, and that's the scale at which we're going. We need to know that. We don't necessarily see that reality in our day-to-day -day life. We need statisticians to tell us. How many people have cell phones? Anybody not have a cell phone? So there's a few of us. Huh, boy, I'm usually the only one. Um, Anyway, I think everybody has used them, and they are amazingly convenient. You can be somewhere and, and connected at the same time. But this kind of reality um, has another side. And so I'd ask you the question, do you have a sense of what this is? What are you looking at? A rug? Yeah. A countertop? TV screen? Yeah, right. <laughs> Let me give you a, a bit of a clue. Uh, dead cell phones. And they aren't just dead cell phones. This is a work by Chris Jordan, and it represents 426,000 cell phones equal to the number of cell phones retired in the US every day. And so when we participate in these activities, they are, we understand them personally, but we don't have feedback loops that give us insight in, into the broad reach of things. And societally, if we are going to live in a globalized world, we need those feedback loops. And this was a powerful one for me. You may have encountered the work of Ed Bertinsky um, and uh, shipwrecking in Bangladesh. And, um, if you ever wondered what happened to the uh, freighters that were commissioned in the 30s and, uh, and sailed the, the oceans for decades, uh, well, this is one of their fates, to end up on the shores of Bangladesh, um, to be ripped apart by people who don't, you're in bare feet, all kinds of sharp metals, um, and they take blow torches to cut this thing up. And then they use the steel, which has lost its tensile strength, in building projects. And, but all of this, uh, you know, this is a craft that allowed us to have a certain level of consumption is no longer available to us. And, um, and so Ed Bertinsky enables us to see some, it's part of the feedback loop. It's why I think artists have that potential um, to do that. And Lynn's gonna talk about a few things. Uh, what we're really doing here is showing you how there are some insights provided by people like artists that you can access to have conversations about the very issues you're engaged in, but also cultural heritage places. We have many First Nations run museums in this country, but I wanted to show you this notion of the keeping place from Australia, which actually has become a new kind of or new entry into the museum definition. And here in this uh, area, uh, not far from Sydney, the Armadale Aboriginal Cultural Centre and keeping place. Notions of keeping places actually have tensions between those which are dealing with the preservation of an Aboriginal heritage and culture and place locations, sacred spaces, sometimes artifacts, and also sometimes contemporary social issues, so uh, bringing youth into that uh, cultural um, uh, understanding uh, as empowerment to how they can live their lives better, but also land claims, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with environmental deterioration of one sort or another. At one end, at the other end, creating these locations to generate tourism and uh, money. So the next one, Doug. Um, I just wanted to show you that we have, in our, even in our museum world, uh, places where um, 
galleries or museums or cultural locations, heritage locations, are trying to engage civic discourse, civil society, other issues. I've been studying with a professor at OISE this uh, exhibit that traveled in, to seven cities in the U.S. without sanctuary, lynching photographs in America. Next slide. And uh, what I just wanted to show you is taking very, very difficult dramatic histories and not saying, no, we don't do that. We don't gloss over history. We actually engage them and experiment with new methods of engaging um, citizens, engaging students, engaging whoever it may be in not only engaging the work, but then having civic forum and dialogue. Are we trained in this? No. There's a lot to be learned from other fields, social work, community development, and so on. But there is a hunger to enter into this. Whether it's District 6 Museum in South Africa or it's a Holocaust site in Germany. And what it points to, I think, is how many uh, opportunities there are, not just in these four-walled places or institutions, but we're engaging in cultural dialogue uh, in grassroots and community. And people can make their own museum expressions in North Toronto, in Thornhill, wherever that may be, in Winnipeg, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very interesting movement. It's the most hopeful one, I think, that I've seen. Uh, in our museum world. So that's, uh, that's the end of that in terms of just some examples of profound um, looking at cultural dynamics and the way we live together in the world. So I had asked Doug if he would, um, uh, we're going to have to shortcut the process, talk about some of this, and go to your indicators and talk right. a little from your insights, how you created it. All okay. And I think what Lynn has shown is, is some real leadership in museum um, settings for actually engaging in cultural issues and, and really working in the messy territory of um, public engagement. Um, and I just wanted to go back and, and say that we, these are feedback loops, and people need them at the individual level. They need them at the collective level. This is an interesting one because we've talked about um, GDP. Um, and this is Mark Inielski, um, an economist out in, in Alberta, um, who actually identifies economy as, as um, oikos uh, nomia, um, household management, um, is the root of, of economy. And, and he asked people, he showed them this graph of um, GDP in Alberta over a period of 40 years and said, mm, is that for people who had lived through that, does this feel right to you? Is this what life has been like, this kind of ascent? And they said, oh, I'm not sure. And then you put in the, the genuine progress indicator, which is the GDP sort of minus a lot of the um, uh, negative attributes of um, GDP and, and actually demonstrated the societal um, decline in, um, in community well-being. So these kinds of feedback loops that I think help people to realize that the assumptions that are driving our systems are not necessarily ones that we should be holding on to. So we were going to hand out a, um, uh, an exercise, but time has just not permitted. Um, but the purpose of it was to get you to um, respond to one of, of three, and we we're just going to get you to do it in the tables, one of three different um, issues. So if you were empowered to, um, to develop a program on sustainable food system, so how would you engage people um, in, in addressing that. And we wanted to see what kind of creativity you, you might come up with and brilliant ideas. And at the same time, um, uh, if you develop two or three ideas, how then would you um, um, prioritize them based on, on the ability to um, uh, achieve certain kinds of outcomes? And we used um, this, this tool that, we used a part of that tool to, uh, to give you a prompt um, for how you might begin to reflect on this. And it comes from the critical assessment framework. And it goes back to the working group on museums and sustainable communities. And, and our belief that culture is a, a really complex phenomenon and that you can't really develop indicators um, that are kind of one dimensional. That you have to know what culture looks like at the individual level. How does somebody engage? Are people engaging? Are they um, uh, stimulated? Do they reflect on things? Do they engage in conversations? Um, 
at the community level? Are there issues in the community that, that really need to be addressed? Um, and, and if so, how would you go about bringing um, them into the community in a way that, that makes sense? Um, and, and the third level is um, the institution. And this is how are institutions able to um, uh, adopt feedback loops and create f feedback loops for themselves that, um, that will give them some insight into whether or not they're making progress in a new world, you know, despite how they might have defined themselves 100 years ago. And then the fourth level is really looking at the big sustainability issues globally. Because we can, we can um, try and figure out what quality of life is in Canada and come to some agreement. But if that isn't somehow aligned with what um, the realities are around the world, then quality of life here um, is, is in danger of uh, being privileged and at the expense of the quality of life in other parts of the world. So those are the, the four different lenses. And I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to get you into the messiness of uh, idea generation and then um, answering some of these, these questions. Um, Mm -hmm. um, as a person who wasn't part of creating this, but has seen it work with my students, for example, or in workshops with museum professionals, this is an interesting list for a couple of reasons. It can be used to measure, going back to our expectations here, how would we measure? But it can also be used as a planning tool, just like any logic model for an evaluation performance indicator. You can flip it to, in fact, be the guiding uh, checking system of how you might, in fact, uh, intend something to, uh, to be aimed at. Um, so it actually has uh, possibilities on a couple of uh, w levels. And um, just a uh, uh, personal commentary. I think I watch people able to do the personal uh, begin to stretch to the community. We're, e we're really good at the institutional. We're really poor at the global. I'd say we aren't very good at the institutional. Except, Doug, we, it's easy to talk about institutional, but not necessarily agree on the deep questions that we're asking. But right. that would apply to anything here. So um, one way to uh, think about this, other than inviting some of your questions about this, might be to go back to the expectations, Doug. Mm -hmm. We have grappled with some questions about definition of culture. Of course you weren't going to get the answer. Sorry, we just complicated it all for you, but you have a few tools. Um, we certainly have a, addressed questions of adaptation shifting um, and the measurement um, and some of the managing questions. We could go on more with the tension between the economic development tourism versus the cultural uh, expressions, et cetera, which has been certainly commented on a couple of times. So how measurement can, in fact, change the sector don't know the answers to that. We just know that we're a couple of folks who are in our uh, particular uh, sector, which is quickly becoming less siloed, um, attempting to change the discourse about what museums are. Um, my brother is an international performance measures expert. He goes from government to government, telling them how to do this work. And just the other day, when I told him I was going to do this, he said, yeah, but if you could only tell us what museums do, then we could measure it. And you will never be able to measure. You can never tell me what you do. I said, excuse me, I, I work in a university. Uh, we can't tell you what we do either. <laughs> Hospitals, um, city government, whatever it might be, don't blame us for being messy. <laughs> so um, will there be any questions uh, to uh, further explain maybe some of this for you or how it's registering? When I look through all this stuff, when I look through all this stuff here, I see that there's a common thread, and in, in if anyone is developing indicators and trying to measure something around culture, am I correct to assume that you're trying to get at um, increased awareness, knowledge, um, sharing? Um, when I look at all these different things, right? I work for the city, so I, I, I have to measure something. It's got to be rubber hits the pavement. Um, theory only goes so far. I've got to pick a measure. And so if I'm going to be looking at cultural, um, I would assume that some of the filters that I would use to select measures would all have to do about increasing people's awareness around their surroundings, their knowledge of their community, their connectivity. Is that a common thread in the work that you've done? It's, That's what I'm interpreting. 
it's, it's part of it, I think, um, uh, gaining greater awareness. But it's also greater connectivity. It's greater reflection about um, um, the problems of the systems that we exist within. And once you're aware of those, having some agency to actually try and affect change. And um, there was a, a fascinating example that, um, of, of how artists could be working in a completely different vein than they currently do. Um, and there was, a, there was a meeting at the AGO, Art Gallery of Ontario, with curators and, and educators. And it was at the office of um, one of our main sponsors. Um, uh, and we just used the boardroom. Anyway, the meeting didn't go anywhere. But in the, in the middle of it, um, the, the fellow who, this is a private bank, um, international banking organization, and, uh, and they said, oh, do you want to have a tour of the, of the um, collection? And uh, I said, yes, I did. And, and it was a photography one. He personally pulled it all together. And we were looking at these beautiful photographs of, of places from around the world. And uh, he said, I really think that the people who work here need to know where the money is going. And, and then we came upon a picture that was completely different. And it was a, an image of a, basically a raped landscape. And everybody said, what? How does this fit in? And it, it actually, I think, was a, an Ed Bertinsky, and I didn't realize that at the time, um, the shipbuilding um, photo. But it was a, an image of a mine. And, and he said, well, this is, this is what I think the, the employees here need to know, is that when we lend money, it ends up creating these kinds of things. I thought, well, why is it not the case that artists couldn't be working to try and bring these feedback loops inside corporate environments um, to, to um, raise issues that need to be addressed? Because we don't find our, you know, we, we wait for regulation to come in. But uh, by embracing um, artists as creative feedback um, uh, loops within a corporate environment, that could be a pretty fascinating way to um, move towards change. So I would say that it's a long way around, but these are, are not indicators, and you, you and they're questions, and that if you had a project notion, you could ask those questions and say, well, what would be an indicator that would show this or prove this? So this is just a framework. And you would then have to use it in a planning context to actually generate the indicators. We have a bicentennial coming up for the War of 1812 that the city is engaged at, a place called Fort York. Measure that and the plans they have against the neighborhood um, life story project going on, which you can uh, check out at Facebook. We're all around Toronto in the various communities. People are coming together and in any way fashionable, in a cultural way, a heritage way, depicting their personal stories. Um, and so there's a difference between celebrating a war somehow and occasionally having a consultation with First Nations, which is you know, possibly tokenistic, um, and versus engaging people in what war means and what our current realities may be. I guess I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with some of the campus sustainability initiatives that are going on. Uh, most of the ones that I'm familiar with are really looking at greening activities um, and uh, reducing footprints and, and energy use and all of that. But I don't know of any that are really looking at how sustainability um, needs to be woven into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the only place to start would be with the student body itself in a dialogue about um, what it values and, and, um, and try and tease out um, what are the underlying issues that are, are really needed. And um, it, it takes some time, I think, because ultimately you'll probably get a lot of people saying, well, I want to have enough knowledge to have a career. But somewhere in there you're going to find people who are going to push harder than that and say, no, 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 we've got we've to get to the, the root of this with the foundation, the cultural foundation that we're trying to build here. Um, and so I, I think it's relationship-based. I think culture is relationship-based. And modern society has, has done a lot to separate people. Um, and, and I would just use a different word, but it's the same point. Participatory processes. Mm -hmm. They take time. So you might be able to create certain objectives right now. Students will, in fact, separate their garbage properly, which I never do properly because I can't read, apparently. 
or you know that kind of measure may be your outcome, but it may be that it's about them defining how they change behavior or how they talk to each other about these kinds of, I mean, you have to have consultative, collaborative uh, processes going on because you may have the wrong notions. Just maybe just a foot, foot for thought. Um, I really like the um, uh, adaptative uh, renewal cycle that you explained. And um, given that everything that we heard uh, during this conference uh, from uh, you know, oil-based economy, the GDP that is uh, not complete, a lack of completeness, and a very short term as a financial system and a financial sector really driving uh, uh, the, uh, the world uh, right now. Do you think we are really heading towards some sort of a, a dramatic release uh, right now? Uh, nothing in the nature can grow constantly. We saw the, 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 the population that is uh, just uh, uh, unbelievably, uh, uh, the, the growth is, 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 is unexpected and it can just go anyway. Mm -hmm. What do you think, have you have, do you have any thoughts about uh, the, what's, what's really coming in terms of the release? I think there are lots of people who are concerned and what happens and what, what people who are looking at systems theory um, fear most is that you, you hold on to um, uh, certain types of systems um, and you buttress them and you try and maintain them so that they don't change. And, and institutions are, are amongst those structures that will create um, incredible rigidity to um, prevent um, being hurt in, by external forces. And if you, if you do that enough and you get enough lined up, you can end up with, a, a, with um, many systems sort of aligning around that point where they have to release and it becomes a cascade, a release cascade, which can end up being catastrophic. Um, and I think there's a real nervousness around that. Um, but I think most people f believe that at this point, human beings really don't seem capable of, of um, embracing change proactively and that they're probably more inclined um, to respond to a uh, crisis. It's a good question, you know, how, how we're gonna deal with it and, and how it will manifest. But yes, I think that you've put, put your finger on something and that is you can get these embedded systems that all end up being aligned and ready to collapse in a, a kind of catastrophic way. And that is the, the nervousness. And it's why I, I keep on asking the question and I don't get a good answer. Why is it that we um, keep um, this value of economic growth? And we all participate in it. We all have RSPs and we all want them to grow for retirement and et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's that growth imperative that we, we uh, apply to all of these things that drives the consumption-based economy, which has its planned obs obsolescence and material throughputs and um, it's a, it's a vicious cycle, and it's going to be very hard to break. And I don't know at what level you, you, somebody can insert themselves and to try and, and break that cycle. It doesn't seem to be governments doing. It doesn't seem to be business. Um, although we see some movement, and we even heard about um, uh, Walmart uh, with its, um, you know, the, the supply chain requirements and things like that. But all of that's geared towards increasing the bottom line. Yeah. Right. It's a it's a, a bit of a nerve wracking time for anybody who's involved in sustainability. But there, it's also been said many times over the last um, couple of days is that there is an incredible amount of movement happening in certain areas, and and the private sector is grappling. And and um, uh, the speaker this morning um, said that uh, that having been in the public sector all her life and now in in the private sector, she's seeing really big changes happening. And it's not fundamental changes yet, but it's significant and it's movement. I guess we, we have to um, be encouraged by that. We have the pessimist, we have the silly optimist. And for me, uh, to go ahead, I have to find some hopefulness and um, the power of certain examples, whether it be your own or whether it be communities that are engaging phenomenal cultural questions that address the very issues you're talking about. So um, maybe I'm the one who's in denial, but uh, 
I think and I'm a, an optimist, actually. All righty then. <laughs>